also ready record cool awesome Cool, welcome everybody. Hello, good morning. Welcome. Cool deal. Give We're gonna give folks a few moments to join. Thank you for sharing your morning with us. A few more moments, if you don't mind uh, muting yourself. And if you would like to share who you are and where you're from in the chat, uh, share whatever you would like. We're so grateful you're here. See some new and old friends. Cool. <laughs> Give folks a few more moments to join and then we'll begin. If you don't mind, uh, share who you are in the chat and cool. Hey, Rebecca. Hello, Kate and Jessica and Anne. Awesome. Wonderful having you all here. <clears throat> all right. So now that it's 11.02, I'm sure folks will trickle in. But welcome. My name is Jessica Stokes, and I am the Associate Director of Partners in Health and Wholeness, and I focus on the statewide mental health advocacy part of our work. And I'm so grateful to have you all here. Today is a special day. And before I go any further, I want to say happy Mental Health Month. Uh, today is Mental Health Advocacy, excuse me, Mental Health Awareness Month. And uh, it's a special month because it is a time to think about all the things that we do for mental health, how we take care of ourselves, how we would like to take care of ourselves, how we want to support others. It's a month to celebrate how mental health enhances our life, how we can have emotional well being and have a full, healthy experience of this life. And it also can offer support and reminders of what could possibly be different in our lives, uh, whether that's trauma-informed practices in our ministries, perhaps we want to learn more about ACEs, ad adverse childhood experiences. Maybe we want to talk about suicide prevention in our faith communities. So May being Mental Health Month is a beacon for the rest of the year as a reminder of all endless possibilities that faith communities have to work on mental health. And, you know, sometimes when we think of mental health, we tend to think of the hard parts of mental health, but I'm here to celebrate with you all that there are possibilities with the hard topics, but also many things that are wonderful about mental health and how, as faith communities, we can invite generational healing and support by working on mental health, by eliminating stigma and more. So if you're interested in that work, and uh, want to talk about normalizing professional therapy in your faith community, getting your people trained, learning how to do a proper referral, uh, becoming trauma-informed, anything related to mental health, please reach out to me and I will put my email in the chat. So that said, happy Mental Health Month. I wanna open us up in prayer and then I'm very grateful to introduce our speaker. So if you don't mind, please join me in prayer. God of love, a love that has no limits. God of hope that knows us by name. We are supported by you through every season, good and hard. Help us rest in your endless love and support and help us love each other as you love us all, God, and help us love ourselves as you love us. 
Let us remove what keeps us from each other, such as labels and stigma, assumptions, judgments, stereotyping, othering, and more. Beckon us to choose each other and to choose ourselves as we practice vulnerability and humility. Keep us in these efforts daily. For when we give up othering and stigma, we gain true peace and community. All this we pray to you. Amen. So today I'm so grateful to have a friend and colleague join us today, the Reverend Dr. Gary Kreitz, who's the executive director of NAMI North Carolina. NAMI, which stands for National Alliance on Mental Illness, is a wonderful organization that has all types of support and resources around mental health. And we are very grateful in North Carolina to have a robust uh, statewide organization in North Carolina, NC NAMI. And so I would want to introduce you, our, my friend to, to you all. He is, uh, before coming to NAMI, Gary spent over 20 years at Duke University as a PhD student in religion and history and as a program director at Duke Continuing Studies, and most recently as the director of operations at Duke's Talent Identification Program. He is an ordained Congregationalist minister, and Gary is committed to a person-centered approach to NAMI's mission, whether in affiliate outreach, staff relations, and especially its work among persons affected by mental illness. So, so grateful for your presence here, Gary. I'm going to pass it on to you. And if you have any questions for Gary, please share them in the chat and, uh, or later on you may ask uh, over your mic, but, but uh, go ahead and put them in the chat if you don't wanna forget them. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Gary. Thank you, Jessica. I, I love coming to this kind of event because, you know, I, in a, in a world and specifically in a nation that seems to be so polarized and angry these days, it's it's really nice to be with people that cross religious boundaries, that cross socioeconomic boundaries, that cross racial and ethnic boundaries, and yet bound together in a, in a common mission. Uh, it, it gives me hope for our world. So I am so grateful for the opportunity to be here today. Um, I'm gonna share my screen. And uh, if it doesn't turn out right, let me know. <clears throat> the The title is, you know, The Saint's Complaint, and um, that should show um, my love for church history. I my, I studied under the late under the late Elizabeth Clark at Duke. Um, I got my PhD there, and then stayed on. Um, but a little bit about myself, I, I was a pastor for about a decade and a half before I came back to get my PhD, and then um, I just stayed on at Duke afterwards. I came to NAMI about um, three years ago, and NAMI is really near and dear to my heart, or the mission is near, uh, for a couple reasons. One is because... Um, when I was a pastor... I had a really, really heavily heavy counseling load. And so the, the dealing with the mental health issues was very uppermost in my life. And the other reason, uh, a much more personal reason, uh, my daughter um, has borderline personality disorder. And so um, I came here in part because of my burden for her. But I'm really glad to share with you today and let's get going. Uh, there is a great legend uh, about St. Boniface, who was 7th and 8th century, great legend that um, he was, he wrote the Pope one time because he was really frustrated with his mission work in Germany. He wrote the Pope and he says, we have a real problem because some of the priests here are so illiterate. I heard a priest the other day baptize someone in nomine patria et filia et spiritu sanctum, which we think is in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But the way he was saying it was, roughly translated in the name of the fatherland, the daughter, and the Holy Spirit. And Boniface said, are these people actually baptized? And he was frustrated because he thought the things that we should be getting right, we're, we're blowing it. Uh, we're not getting it right. And I think that's a really good uh, um, 
a really good parallel to what we deal in our religious bodies related to mental health. It's something that we desperately need to get right. And it's something that so often we don't. So just for the fun of it, you, you don't have to say these out loud. This is just a few f fact or myth related to some things that you hear related to mental health. You don't have to say it out loud. Uh, Fact or myth, religious beliefs have measurable benefit to someone with mental health challenge. That's actually a fact. That's actually a fact. We know that religious involvement is related to better coping. It's it's helping, helpful with depression, with anxiety, with substance abuse. Um, one of my friends, uh, Dr. Harold Koenig, who is a, a psychiatrist at D the D Duke Medical Center, has done some really interesting, really controversial research on the relationship between health and mental, and uh, between health and religious belief. And uh, he finds that there is, a, there is a definite benefit in religious belief. Now, the controversial part of it is apparently the benefit has nothing to do with you know oh, I'm living a better life you know I don't drink and I don't chew and I don't go with girls or do it has nothing to do with that at all it has to do with something about the the relationship between the two and it doesn't even have to be something that you actually believe which I think is an interesting one number two in the Middle Ages, religious leaders usually attributed what we call mental illness to demonic forces. That sounds logical, right? It's a myth. There were some, there were some, but by far and away, uh, the, uh, the, uh, in the Middle Ages, if you had a mental health condition, it was considered from Galen and from Hippocrates that you had your humors messed up in your system. Uh, they were yellow bile, black bile, blood, and phlegm, uh, which is terms that we don't use very much anymore. Uh, but it wasn't simply demonic. Next one, because suicide is considered a sin in many faith traditions, religious people are less likely to think about or attempt suicide. That's a myth. Past suicide attempts are more common among depressed patients with a religious affiliation. Suicide ideation was greater among depressed people who considered religion more important and those that attended services more frequently. Next one. Most pastors know someone with a serious and persistent mental illness. That's absolutely the truth. Um, one in five adults in America have... Um, have a mental illness. And so if you have a parish of 100 people, uh, the odds are 20 of them are going to be dealing with mental health. Now, serious and persistent are less common than, uh, than I want to say routine mental illnesses. That's a bad term to use. Uh, but still, undoubtedly, pastors, whether they are aware of it or not, are ministering to somebody that has a serious and persistent mental illness. Here's an interesting one. Mainline divinity schools attached to major universities typically require more counseling than evangelical seminaries. That's a myth. As a matter of fact, some of the most prestigious uh, seminaries, um, Yale, uh, even Duke, um, have really very little requirements. Uh, the, the average pastor gets out of seminary with one course in pastoral counseling, which is just enough to make that person very dangerous. Evangelical seminaries frequently require more, but what I find is that in some of the literature coming out of uh, evangelical seminaries, it's not quite as in-depth of, of work that's being done in, uh, in mental health. So the question that we have is, is religion an asset or is it a liability to mental health? And what I'd like to argue is that it's both. Uh, it, ha it has both. For, um, as I said a little bit while ago, a religious experience does tend to lead itself to better outcomes. Um, a person to have, have a sense of hope, a person to have a sense of, 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 of where I can turn to. Uh, the statistics are clear. It does give comfort. Uh, there are times when I am in my deepest, 
depression that sometimes, honestly, the thing that keeps me going is my, my faith in God. Uh, it's the thing that keeps me going. And by the way, I have no hesitation saying that I struggle with depression and that I've been in counseling. I think the only way we're going to get rid of stigma is if we leaders start being honest about our own mental health conditions. Another asset, and probably the most important one, it gives a sense of community. Uh, we know that people simply do better when they're in relationships, when they're in a sense of community. So religious experience, especially with, if it's within a body, whether it be a church, whether it be a synagogue, uh, the sense of community is a huge step uh, in favor of mental health. But there are also some really significant liabilities. Stigma. Jessica mentioned that earlier. Stigma is huge. Uh, in a lot of traditions, mental health is still seen as a spiritual failing. It's, a, it's seen in some cases even as a sin. And, um, and a lot of us were raised in families where it's like, you know, you, you don't tell anybody outside of the house that you're struggling. You don't air your dirty laundry to other people. And the stigma is sometimes tied into religion, in part because of conflict of values. I mean, what I've heard too many times is, I know you're struggling with depression, but if you just spend more time in prayer, your depression will go away. Um, I've heard um, a, a friend of mine, I love him to pieces, but he said, if, if I'm lying, I'm dying. He said, if there is adequate preaching in the pulpit, there will never be a need for a counselor. That is absurd. That's like saying, if there is adequate preaching in the pulpit, there is never a need for an oncologist. That's, that's foolish. We would never say that with a physical illness, but we say it all the time. And there are certain religious traditions that are especially susceptible to the stigma and the conflict of values. Another real challenge is um, professionals that are untrained. And we're gonna be dealing with that in a little bit. So I'm not gonna spend too much there. And then I'm not gonna spend much on this, but we do have to recognize that sometimes religious experience is a symptom of mental health. Now, I'm not saying that if you're religious that you're having a mental health condition, but what I'm saying is obsession, obsessive compulsive addiction can show itself in religion just as it shows itself in chemical dependency. So asset or liability, it's both. So what can be done? What do we do within our religious bodies, both on the local level and on the, the uh, denominational level and then beyond? Um, I would suggest that there are a few things that we need to start doing if we are going to start making headway within religion on the subject of mental health. First one is, as I suggested earlier, there has to be more counseling in the seminary curriculum. And I know it's, it's not a popular thing to say because uh, my master of divinity was, I think it was 136 hours and nearly all of that was packed and it wasn't, there weren't a lot of electives built into it, but we absolutely have to because like it or not, especially in rural areas, the religious leader of a congregation is the default first choice of who you go to if you're, have, if you're struggling mentally. Uh, if, if your daughter is depressed, you're more likely to go to your, your pastor or your rabbi than you will to go to a professional counselor. We have to have people that are more trained uh, coming out of seminary. Uh, one course will not do it. As I said, one course will make you dangerous. I think there has to be ongoing training for religious leaders. And if it is not built into your denomination to do that, I think that you need to seek it out on your own. There is really good training that's out there. Uh, there's really bad training too. So, you know, you don't want to go to a place that has simplistic answers that has, uh, but religious leaders need ongoing training. Uh, we need to step up our game with religious counselors, uh, pastoral counselors, um, Christian counselors, and so forth. The seminary I went to, I, I love my seminary, but the number one uh, pastoral counselor professor was putting out a book about every six months. I'm sorry, if you're putting out a book on psychology every six months, you're not dealing with the subject in depth. Uh, and so we have people that are coming out that aren't necessarily 
that highly trained. And we have to have pastoral counselors and religious counselors that know the field every bit as much as secular counselors. And we need to have more resources for congregations. And I'm gonna be talking a little bit over the next few minutes about some of the resources um, for NAMI. Uh, okay. A lot of you probably have heard of NAMI. NAMI is the National Alliance on Mental Illness. It is the largest grassroots organization in the country uh, that deals with um, support, advocacy, and education for those who have mental health conditions. Um, now, if you know anything about NAMI, you know some of the main programs. And these are programs that are available around the state in affiliates around the state. We have the state office here in Raleigh. We have 24 affiliates gathered around the state. Some of you know of our, of our signature programs. Family to Family is a program where families who deal with a loved one with mental health condition help with other families who are just now coming to grips with that. NAMI Basics is one for, for children. If you have a child that has a mental health condition, NAMI Homefront is for um, veterans and military officials. Uh, peer to Peer is a program that we offer. I'm going over these quickly because there's another resource I really want to focus on. So I'm just doing these very quickly. NAMI Smarts is an advocacy program. I have no idea what the I at the end of that means. Um, we also have support groups, uh, family support groups, NAMI connection recovery support groups. Uh, people, uh, we do that through the state office and we do it through affiliates. And we not only have uh, general support groups for family members who are dealing with loved ones who have mental health conditions, but we have more specialized ones as well. Uh, the, the NAMI Durham has a really excellent support group um, for African-Americans. Uh, we're developing support groups for the LGBTQ community, for the Latina uh, community uh, in, in Spanish and then presentations that we offer. But what I really wanna focus on today is what's called NAMI FaithNet. This is where I really wanna spend the, the remainder of our time to talk to you what's available uh, through NAMI FaithNet. Now, NAMI FaithNet is not an organization. You know, you can't get onto the NAMI website and say, I'd like to join FaithNet. It's not an organization. It's a network for sharing resources to help people of faith tell their stories. And there are a lot of different resources that there are. Uh, the first thing that NAMI FaithNet does is it helps faith communities develop supportive environments. There is a resource called Reaching Out to Faith Communities. Uh, it's a four-part self-study. Uh, it's a training to equip NAMI members who want more instruction on how to engage with, educate, and share, and promote mental health awareness in, with their faith groups. There's also Bridges of Hope. Uh, Bridges of Hope is for NAMI members and leaders who are already familiar with the materials and reaching out to faith communities. And it's, it's for people who are comfortable to speak with community organizations. It's, there's a second PowerPoint presentation, Bridges of Hope. It's written to, to, to educate people um, on how to approach your faith community and uh, raise its awareness. Um, by the way, this is just an aside, this is a shameless plug. Uh, the, I am now, a, uh, I'm still ordained, but I'm a, uh, I try to be the kind of lay person for my pastor that I always wanted to ha have when I was a pastor, but I am available. If you, if you ever want somebody to fill in on a Sunday morning to come and preach and use texts that are related to something with mental health, it doesn't have to be that. I can just come in general, but I really want to start building relationships. The other thing I want to do is start building relationships with ministerial associations around this around the state uh, so that we can bring some of the training resources in the next thing that nami faith net does is it recognizes the value of spirituality in our recovery uh, there are blogs that you can use uh, it's it's designed to create wellness do you know what i mean when i say community inclusion um, it's sort of a technical term community inclusion is a relatively recent phenomenon. Uh, essentially what community inclusion is, is it says what we traditionally have done 
is we have taken people that deal with mental health conditions, especially like if they're institutionalized, and we'll send the pastor there to do a special service. Or if we're really progressive, we'll take a bus and we'll bring a few people with mental health conditions into the church, sit them in the back of the church, put them back on the bus when it's done and take them back. That is not community inclusion. Community inclusion is designed for people that deal with mental health conditions to have agency over their own life and to be actively involved in the community, including in their faith communities, not simply as a periodic attender, but in every fabric, every fiber of what the organization does. Uh, it's absolutely critical. And I think this is something that we can start doing um, uh, with FaithNet, but within our congregations, is start finding ways to incorporate people more deeply into the fabric of our faith communities that have a mental illness. Uh, FaithNet, it has sermons, that can be used. It has prayers that can be used. It is a really, really good resource. There's training on how you should tell your story to your clergy. You know, a lot of clergy, the idea of opening their church to ministering to those with mental health is so scary because it feels like I'm losing, I have no control over what's going to be happening. Uh, we need to find ways to start talking to our clergy about our stories. And um, I was at a church not too long ago, uh, Baptist Church in, um, um, General Baptist Church in, in Durham. And the pastor on a Sunday morning got up and he talked about how he was struggling with depression because of the, the coronavirus. I was so moved by that because I know that in a lot of congregations to be that transparent, is, it's almost risky. Uh, people are gonna think that I'm not able to do the job anymore. So we need people that are able to tell their stories, including to other clergy. So FaithNet is a remarkable resource. resource. Um, I will send this, um, this PowerPoint to Jessica uh, so that you can see the resources. Uh, this is where you would contact our national organization to get information on NAMI FaithNet. And then also, you can always contact us here at NAMI North Carolina. Um, I love my staff because our staff is really diverse. It's diverse in, in racially, it's diverse in socially, but it's also very diverse religiously. Uh, from people of deep faith to people that will say, I am not a person of faith, and we work together and we make it work. So anybody can help you at NAMI North Carolina, but if you want something specifically related to the church, please don't hesitate to contact me. Uh, I, that's my phone number and my email address. And I just gave you like a two hour presentation in 30 minutes. So I apologize if I went through it too quickly, but I want to leave it open to any questions that people or anything that we can discuss among ourselves. Thank you, Gary. Gosh, that was wonderful. Uh, I'm going to, if it's okay with you, your contact information, what you just shared, we, we will share the power, the, the slides, but I'll also make sure to highlight that information. Hmm. Uh, Thank you for that great presentation. We have a couple of comments. I believe that anybody who has a question, please feel free to raise your hand or just unmute yourself and ask away. Uh, I want to highlight one comment. Thank you, Rebecca, uh, saying, I think we've been leaning towards pastors making referrals because they aren't trained, but because of a long wait list to see psychologists or counselors, pastors are seeing people more than ever, and we need training. And I couldn't agree more. It's, uh, you you made a, a funny quip at this, Gary. It's dangerous. You know, we go to seminary, we go to divinity school, we know just enough to be dangerous. At least most of us uh, are not clinically trained or professionally accredited to provide counseling. So, you know, that's a big part of my job. I'm seeing across the state what exactly Rebecca's talking about. I see this every day in my work. It is so true. But as pastors that are called into counseling, whether we want, some of us love doing it. Some of us right. hate doing it. Mm -hmm. uh, but the single number one important thing when you're doing pastoral counseling, 
when you feel like you're getting in over your head, refer yes. immediately. That's right. Refer immediately. Uh, it, there's no, there's no shame in saying, you know, Thomas, I, what you're saying is really important. And honestly, it is, I think it's beyond my ability to really help you. I can pray with you. I can support you. I can be your, be your pastor, but what you're dealing with is really important. I think you, it's, it's important for you to talk to somebody who's a specialist in that. Uh, the first thing you do is refer when you feel like you're over your head. Um, yeah. That's that's wonderful uh, advice, and I couldn't agree more. I think so. What are some options then? Uh, and tell me, Gary, if you want to add to this list. So, one, there's a difference between a clinical referral and a referral for further assistance and support when you are over your head. But if you do feel comfortable, perhaps there's ways to have support groups at your church through NAMI and other organizations where if people do do need support or extra support. Uh, they may be willing to meet in groups, which that can help with the bandwidth. Uh, but also with that, I just want to remind our, our anybody in supportive roles on the call today that one, it is important to know how to do a referral. And if you do not know how to do a referral, reach out to me because we have resources around that. Two, if you um, knowing how to do a referral and having other people on staff, including your office manager, having a list of a referral network already premeditated, you can actually help uh, treat and prevent burnout with your your pastoral staff because not everybody, you're not always responding to the acute things. You can help people more upstream, and it helps out a lot with emotional well-being those in the supportive roles. But mm -hmm. yeah, Rebecca, we, I hear you on that. And I think there's plenty of, uh, of need for training. I also want to highlight trainings around suicide prevention and uh, emotional CPR is a great training and mental health first aid training and uh, uh, faith uh, administration, the suicide prevention training that is really wonderful. I will put in the chat that any kind of training pastors QPR, did, yes. QPR is valuable. And I, I never want you to think that I'm trying to diminish the importance of, of our faith in dealing with mental health crisis. I mean, I, I, I rely on prayer. I rely on yeah. prayer, but it, but I believe to the core of my being that all truth, if it is truth is God's truth, uh -huh. even if it doesn't have a religious label on it. So it, there's nothing intrinsically against our faith to send someone to a good provider who can really help that person. All truth, if it is truth, is God's truth. Mm. Cool. Let's see. Uh, thank you, Gary. Yeah, I, th I think we're all on the same page with that, that value. Uh, Ralph, I think you were about to ask a question, but I don't see it. Uh, I don't see it. So you want to finish that? Um, let's see here. Do I see any raised hands? I'm so, so Gary, you talked about so many vital things, so many very vital things. And one thing that you did talk about, I don't want to get ignored, is that the importance, if you are able, depending on your context and your situation, to talk about your own experience of mental health, how crucial that is. And I just want to say, uh, revisit that. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for saying that. And, uh, and, and that is such a great example of how we can break stigma together mm. and talk about and be transparent and open. I think that if you open the door a little bit, it eventually gets swung open, so to speak. And with all that we have been holding with COVID, uh, so many of us, resonate with what you're saying. So thank you. You know, one of the concerns that I have uh, sometimes, yeah. and I don't know how to say this, that it, I don't want it to sound judgmental, but sometimes as spiritual leaders, we do our, our people a disservice if we make them think that we are spiritual giants that mm -hmm. never struggle. 
if we that we never struggle we're spiritual giants you know i i'm a spiritual giant and and my kids my kids are all spiritual giants they're all um sometimes it's really valuable for a spiritual leader a pastor a, a teacher to be able to say i struggle I struggle and I don't have all the answers, but I know who does have the answers. There's nothing wrong with that. And I, it's like the old statement said, as spiritual leaders, what we are doing, all we are doing is we are one thirsty person telling another thirsty person where we found water. Mm -hmm. we're, not, we're not spiritual giants. We're not spiritual giants that have no spiritual challenges. We struggle just as much. Elijah on the mountain struggled mm -hmm. with depression, struggled with uh, uh, hopelessness. We as spiritual leaders need to start taking that mantle on ourselves and saying, I struggle with a mental health challenge. It's not my fault, but I want to share with you about it. I love that. Thank you, Gary. Uh, Ralph? Thanks for circling back. Ralph says, uh, would want to comment on the role of guilt in the Christian tradition, whether it contributes to mental disease for some people. And so, Gary, I think we're talking about guilt here with the Christian tradition. Um, Jessica, you, you broke up a little bit. Could oh, you oh. say that again? Yes. Ralph's comment, he wants to comment on the role of guilt in the Christian tradition, whether it contributes to mental difficulties for some people. So if I'm understanding correctly, Ralph is asking your comment on how guilt impacts those of uh, persons of faith in getting resources around mental health. Um, guilt, guilt and shame are two, are two sides of, this, of the same coin. Um, my brother-in-law, who is just an amazing person, and he's a Christian counselor up in Michigan, um, he does all of his work dealing with people that are, that are carrying shame out of their childhood, carrying shame, and how much that sense of shame affects their mental health and their, their ability to go on. Uh, people that in some cases were victims of t terrible abuse as children or... Uh, or were told they were they weren't worth anything, and, and then guilt also uh, the, the sense of of condemnation. Uh, I don't mean to preach, but but the Bible does say there is now no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. You know, we've got to get to the point where we are we stop using shame and guilt. Uh, it ruins a person's mental health. Yeah, definitely. No, nope. we welcome any words you want to share, Gary. Thank you for sharing that. Don't worry about preaching around around these folks. Uh, Jessica has a, a wonderful question. She asks, I wonder if there are also resources to help families who are supporting family members dealing with mental illness, how to love them, support them, and also set boundaries. Is there a training or maybe a resource I could point congregation members to in addition to referrals for them? And I, I hope you mentioned the NAMI. Uh, yeah, program. NAMI, that's a really good question, um, Jessica. Um, uh, there are wonderful, wonderful resources out there. Some are faith-based resources. Um, ours is not directly faith-based, our family to family, but family to family is a, is a wonderful resource for family members that are struggling with, I love this child more than anything in the world. And it rips me apart that I, that she's, she's 25 and she's spiraling out of control and there's nothing I can do about it. And family to family is a really, really good resource for that. Um, another, uh, another good organization, again, it's a secular organization, but really one is uh, Mental Health America. Mm -hmm. um, th those of you that know Mental Health America of the Central Carolinas down in Charlotte, uh, Kathy just runs, an, they are, they do some really incredibly important research into mm -hmm. what the current state of mental health is. Um, there, there are there are pastoral counselors out there that are really good. My counselor, uh, my counselor is is a Christian counselor, and I find her really really helpful. Uh, she uses faith, but she doesn't use a simplistic faith. Mm. 
Yeah, great question, Jessica. And just to add on to that, with uh, boundaries and being a caregiver of any type, one one also outlook I want to uh, bring up is the work of harm reduction. Harm reduction, of course, is centered around opioid. The work around the addiction and and a national. Uh, approach, individual and communal approach of just being with people and supporting people is wonderful around eliminating stigma. But they also deal with, as you said, Gary, loving somebody who uh, is, you're trying to find the best way to be a supportive family member or friend. And so the work of harm reduction has a lot to say around that. And also in caregiving in general, there are, thanks to the internet, there's a lot of wonderful resources out there. So around boundaries and supporting folks, which can be applied to all types of situations. So Mm. definitely recommend family to family. And speaking of boundaries, uh, to those of you that are spiritual leaders and pastors, uh, let me just say this as a big brother, you need to set boundaries around yourself. Yeah. You need to start taking care of yourself. Um, some of you dear people are burning yourself out because if there's ever a need arises, you're there for that need. And I think that's wonderful. That's such a, a, a loving thing to do, but you will not be good for anybody if you're not taking care of yourself. Um, one thing that I suggest, um, and my counselor suggested to me years ago, and I, I still do it, is I carve out two days, or excuse me, two hours every week for myself, two hours. Mm-hmm. You know how hard it is to carve two hours out of your schedule? For me, it's Sunday afternoon. I would encourage you to get into that because you have been called by God, but you have not been called by God to kill yourself. Mm -hmm. you deserve to take care of yourself. And if that means carving out a couple hours where I am off limits to my family, I'm off limits to my friend. One day I may be at Barnes and Noble reading the next day. I might be on the Eno river hiking, but Mm -hmm. those two hours, spiritual leaders, we need to start drawing boundaries around ourselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Even Jesus, even Jesus at times got away on his own. That's right. No, thank you, Gary, for that very wonderful reminder. Um, really appreciate that. Uh, yeah. it, I would like to add, I think, that we can also extend that idea because we also have Lady um, on the call. And I think there's a culture of always keep doing, always keep doing more, always keep doing not just more, but more and better. And somehow what we're doing is n- never enough. And so um, I, would, I would like to say that um, I think extending that idea of finding um, two hours to ourselves um, or finding time to just be is also very important kind of for everyone. Um, and I had also had a question I wanted to ask for the faith communities um, who would be interested in doing something like a, um, like a, um, a mental health support group like i've mm-hmm. heard it talked about in multiple you know multiple ways and i've seen some in a few churches but i was wondering if you could just kind of um talk about what that could look like if a if a faith community wanted to have like a support group but it's not necessarily focused on a particular mental illness like what could that what would that look like um possibly that's a great question. Um, I also want to come back to your earlier comment, which I think was really, really good comment, and Nicole. Um, uh, it's hard for me not to be NAMI centric because I know NAMI more than anything else. Uh, but a lot of support groups are done through local affiliates, um, and so what I would encourage you to do, depending on where you are around the state, to contact your local affiliate. I see my, my dear friend, Hannah Carroll, who is the head of the affiliate down in Cumberland, Harnett Lee in Fayetteville. They do some amazing work and they do some amazing work working with churches. Uh, so there are some affiliates around that will, will do that. I would encourage you to go that route. Uh, a support group a support group has to be a support group. It, it can never be a, we are here to solve your problems. You know, come here and we're solving. That's not gonna, that, that will never work. It truly has to be a place where people are safe 
that they can be as completely transparent as they are and safe. So I would encourage you to um, contact me or contact your local affiliates around there. Uh, there are other organizations as well. Uh, but Nicole, about your earlier comment about laity, I think that is really true. I think what we have done in our culture is that we have we have canonized the idea of overwork. That overwork is a isn't it really strange that we take something that's fundamentally a vice and we've turned it into a virtue? You know, working yourself till you drop. We we've, we've made that into a virtue. That's not a virtue. Uh, you're not going to be good for yourself. You're not going to be good for your family. So your point is really well taken. Everybody needs to learn to, to establish boundaries. That's right. And I want to add on if that's okay. With uh, support groups, there's all kinds of ways to host support groups. One, for instance, there's grief circles and there's training on how to start and sustain a grief circle. So I know about that. We actually have friends with partners in health and wholeness who do that. And also if depending on what situation or hoping to work on, for instance, the International OCD Foundation has uh, ways to start local support groups, but also uh, CareNet Counseling, which is a wonderful organization in North Carolina has ways to begin that work. And so if that is something you are interested in, please research and explore that because uh, reach out to me big or Gary because there are wonderful resources on that and uh, and some some of which you do not have to have a licensed professional it can have work groups and toolbox toolkits to help you begin that work and mm. so forth Jessica can I comment yeah hello Becky welcome hey. um I started a mental health ministry at my church in Matthews Matthews United Methodist last year and um, we are offering support groups. We're you currently we're using a curriculum from an organization called Grace Alliance. Um, Matt Stanford, who's now in Houston, was a part of that organization and contributed a lot to the development of that curriculum. Now he's moved on, and a guy by the name of Joe Padilla, who was his partner is running it now. I would encourage you to look at Matt Stanford's work because he has curricula, um, Grace Alliance, um, My Quiet Cave, we tried it first, but we like Grace Alliance. We're also doing a monthly education session. Every, every month we do a education session on um, a mental health topic. This month it's gonna be on stigma. Um, so nice. you, can, you can build that up as a grassroots thing, but uh, Matt Stanford's work was, was sort of really what prompted me to get going with it, but, but you can do it. Yeah. Great resources, Becky. Thank you. Yeah, Becky, uh, at Matthews UMC, I want to highlight Becky and that church real quick is that they started offering big general mental health uh, opportunities and events and then they were able to dive in deeper because folks began sharing more individual needs and they were able to understand more of of uh, individual needs so Becky and Matthews EMC has been doing wonderful work on mental health advocacy uh, as lay people thanks to thanks to their work so very much appreciate Matthews EMC I want to visit Rod's uh, comment. Rod, my old friend in Greenville, North Carolina, uh, he says, regarding guilt and shame, are clergy involved with the trauma-informed community movement? Dr. Bruce Perry and Oprah Winfrey have a wonderful text, uh, not what's wrong with you, but rather entitled, what happened, what to, happened you? to you? Thank you, Rod, for sharing. And yes, uh, I don't mean to speak for you, Gary, but we, many clergy are working on trauma and learning about trauma-informed practices and Partners in Health and Wholeness actually has a free resource called Becoming a Trauma-Informed Faith Community Toolkit, which is on our website. You can see liturgical resources, prayers, uh, discussion questions, resources, and two 30-minute YouTube videos on becoming a trauma-informed faith community. 
Uh, Gary, anything you want to say about this? No, I, I think it is. I think each generation, there, there are one or two ideas that come out of counseling that are just paradigm shifting. And I think trauma-informed care is one of, the, one of those paradigm shifting things. Uh, we have so often focused on, you know, why are you doing this? What's, what's wrong with you? We've made it pathological rather than that it comes out of trauma. So um, I would, I would put, put a plug out for partners health uh, um, in health and holding wholeness holiness I almost said wholeness uh, <laughs> I, honestly when I need resources and I and I need to brainstorm on something I go to Jessica you know and I bounce ideas off of her so uh, don't ever hesitate to con contact the council the council has some remarkable resources and some really excellent people yeah oh thanks Gary for that shout out I appreciate it and um Going back through the chat, thank you, Linda, for your wonderful comment. Uh, apologies if I've missed any questions from folks. Let's see here. Oh yeah, Kara, thank you. I'll add uh, AA Alcoholics Anonymous and, and Anon, the 12 Excellent. step support groups. Could not agree more. They are such a lifeline for, for uh, people. Thank you for bringing that up. Yeah. See if I've missed any raised hands. I can't thank you enough for your time and energy, not only today, but just in life in general. Oh, here we are. Rod says, our clergy learning practices that help us stabilize in the face of toxic stress. We spoke of connectedness and community, faith traditions around the world have practices that Bessel van der Kolk speaks of as synchronized body movement, singing, community, chanting, group prayers, and liturgy. Uh, so are we learning about all this in the face of toxic stress? So that's a great question. It's beyond my level of expertise. Mm -hmm. Well, I do think that uh, by the sheer interest in mental health provoked by a global pandemic, but also if we're all being very honest with ourselves this has been de decades centuries mental health has been a part of our everyday life in, in good and hard ways and i do think that clergy are responding i don't mean to to answer in such a generalization but but rod that's a wonderful point that with toxic stress and all that we are all holding i know that i can speak personally that I work every day with pastors all and lay leaders all over the state who are trying to think of a different way of, of doing life together, meaning think about mental health, eliminating stigma, uh, think about ways to be a compassionate and hope-filled response to all kinds of concerns. Uh, so so from, a, from a hopeful perspective, I see this every day in my work. Most of us, I think, that are in mental health th think that there is going to be a second pandemic when this pandemic is over, a mm. pandemic of, of mental and behavioral health concerns. Uh, and it's going to be interesting to find out what the long-term effect is going to have. Mm. I mean, we, we say our kids are resilient. They are resilient. But, you know, all of the rites of passage that our kids are supposed to go through have not been able to go through. Um, it's, <laughs> excuse me, I'm just, I'm concerned that we are right on the brink of something really challenging. We don't know what it's going to be, and it's going to require faith communities. The faith communities have always been in the forefront of social change and also of social healing. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to have to step up to the plate on this one. Yeah, I, I love, I love that, uh, reminder, but also is a conviction, Gary. I think that uh, if there's any closing questions, please speak now. Otherwise, we will uh, begin our closing thoughts. But Gary, I want to give you an opportunity. Is there any last closing thoughts you want to offer? I, I just am so appreciative that you would allow me to come and be a part of it. Um, I, I think the value is not the information that we 
give across on a PowerPoint, but mm -hmm. it's the sense of community that we have. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's a, the the value of this kind of call is that we realize that we're we're not in this alone. Mm -hmm. So I am so honored that you would allow me to be a part of it. Oh, it's our it's we are so appreciative, Gary. Thank you for saying that, but we are truly grateful for your expertise and energy and time. I know I speak for everybody on this call that this has been a wonderful hour together. And uh, I'm going to put some links here. Let's see. Actually, I don't know if, uh, you know, that didn't save. Let's see here. I will share. We're going to share an email with some helpful resources with these links that I thought would translate onto the chat. Uh, but you'll get the recording, you'll get the PowerPoint, and you will get some helpful links uh, for resources that we mentioned today. A couple of things that I just want to bring to everybody's attention and to continue the celebration of our time together in this wonderful community and mental health month is that our partners in health and wholeness, BIPOC, so Black and Brown Indigenous Persons of Color Mental Health Grant is officially open as of this week. Mm -hmm. So please know that uh, if your faith community is predominantly of color, we, we encourage you and welcome and invite you to apply for funds to work on mental health. And that is between five to $10,000. Uh, we have 50 grants in that range. And then later in the year, we will have a bigger grant available to begin a mental health resource hub in your region. So you please check out our website or social media. You will see information about that, including in our follow-up email. Uh, and also, if you are not predominantly of color, please, please apply for one of our regular PHW grants and use that towards mental health if you feel convicted by today, different ideas. And so very grateful for that. Uh, go ahead, Gary. And remember that yesterday uh, is was murdered and in missing Indigenous Women Day. Ah, That's yeah. just really, um, really near and dear to my heart. Thank you for bringing that up. Yes, there's so many, so, so many um, ways that we can talk about these days in our faith communities and bring up, bring awareness to these issues by by acknowledging days like that. So thank you. That's a great. Great reminder. Uh, a couple of upcoming events Partners in Health and Wholeness invites you to is that we have a clergy breakfast, the opioid crisis, the faith community responds clergy breakfast, which will be in person May 11th between 8.30 and 11.30 a.m. at the Lincoln County Department of Health, 200 Gamble Drive, Lincolnton, North Carolina. Uh, that information is on our website, but just know that that's in person May 11th. So if you're interested in that, please reach out and we will get you more information. And then next week, not on Friday, but Thursday, we're very grateful to have a Faith Health Connection on Zoom. Join us this upcoming Thursday, May 12th at 11 a.m. for Faith Health Connection older adults and mental health. Uh, that'll be a wonderful resource as uh, that that day. Um, let's see here, let me get back to the screen. But to close this with a couple of thoughts, I just wanna say thank you again to Gary and thank you to each person here. Thank you for your energy showing up. I know that Zoom, it gets harder and harder to log in, it feels like, but this was a wonderful, important hour together. And I'm so grateful for you having the courage and bravery to think about mental health with your faith community, thinking about it in your own life. I know that it's a, it's a hard subject for many of us to think about when uh, we grew up with all kinds of intrinsic messages, overt messages around mental health. And you all, by coming here and joining us today and learning and sharing the space with us, you are already beginning a journey of healing and thinking about mental health in a new way. And so I celebrate that with you. I'm grateful for you. I'm grateful for your presence and your work in the world. We need you, each person here on this call, we need you. And uh, mental health is so vital to our communities and our individual lives. And Partners in Health and Wholeness is here for you. 
to work alongside with you and support you in this work. So keep showing up. We're so grateful for you. And uh, be on the lookout for our follow-up email. But everybody have a wonderful weekend and happy Mental Health Month. This is a wonderful time to remember all the ways that we can be uh, beacons of hope in our communities through our faith community. So, so take care, everybody, and um, and feel free to unmute yourself to say goodbye or to hop off. But we're very grateful for you all. Thank, Thank you, everybody. Cool. Thank you so much, Gary. That was wonderful. You're my, it was my pleasure, Jessica. Thank you. Very grateful for 